Lyndon is correct, actually. Uh, let me invite first at the stage uh, my panelist, uh, Si Yuan Pan from uh, uh, Fangda Partners, uh, and Stanley Song, Head of uh, Security Services China, BNP uh, Paribas. And uh, online, we shall have uh, Wen Hong Xie, who is uh, Head of uh, China Program uh, Climate Bond Initiative. Uh, hello, please take a seat. Hello, Wen Hong, can you hear us? Yes, loud and clear. Fantastic. So um, thank you very much, uh, uh, everyone, for being here with us. Uh, we heard a lot about the challenges and opportunities in China. Uh, it's really exciting time, really. Uh, we're cross board or on the road somewhere um, in terms of uh, uh, politics, in terms of economics uh, uh, challenges, and in terms of uh, uh, market challenges as well. So it's um, really uh, very timely uh, to have this conference, and uh, as has been mentioned on numerous occasions already, we have this great white paper which deals with China capital markets, with uh, the hundreds of uh, recommendations that we made. Uh, sustainable finance made it to the white paper for first time uh, this edition because it's been recognized as one of the uh, upcoming and uh, already super hot topics uh, in China and internationally. So I'm uh, uh, very glad really to be able to uh, moderate this panel, uh, bringing together uh, experts uh, across the board really uh, to bring, give us a little bit of perspective as to um, where sustainable finance in China is and uh, to equip us to understand a little bit better what are the opportunities and what we can expect in the future. And um, ever since President Xi announced the 2030 and 2060 uh, targets for China uh, to peak in 2030 and to achieve uh, net zero by 2050, there has been a fury of activities uh, and a lot of excitement uh, across the market because I'm not going to quote numbers because they differ depending on who you read, but we're talking about billions and trillions of investments that will be needed for uh, the global economy, but also in China as one of the uh, main emitters right now, but also uh, uh, one of the great potentials, uh, potential markets for actually uh, bringing technological and uh, uh, economic changes to address uh, uh, this challenge. Uh, so. In, a, in terms of uh, uh, opportunities and investment opportunities, huge market, undeniably. In terms of also impact on uh, your investments, either equities, bonds, or any other tools and investments that you might be making in China, uh, sustainability and uh, ESG alignment broadly would be key for the return of your investments and uh, would be key, uh, hopefully, uh, in your risk management uh, tool and understanding the, the longevity and uh, the, the long-term prospects of uh, uh, your investments. So time could really be not uh, uh, more timely. And uh, um, we uh, had regulators uh, sitting uh, here before us. Uh, Julia uh, Lung also addressed the issue of sustainability at the beginning, uh, spelling out clearly that Hong Kong uh, is uh, going to focus on sustainability and would like to maintain uh, it's uh, a prominent role among other uh, financial center hubs uh, in channeling sustainability investments, uh, not only uh, between the rest of the world and China, but also uh, within Asia and Asia Pacific. Uh, so huge opportunities really for us sitting in China and uh, for us thinking about, uh, for sitting in Hong Kong and thinking about China. So without further ado, actually, um, I would like to uh, uh, ask my panelists a few questions uh, to help us understand a little bit more where we are in this journey. And I will uh, uh, start uh, with uh, uh, Wen Hong uh, to give us um, his, his, uh, his view and his reading as to where we are in terms of definitions and in terms of understanding and the policy landscape uh, in China where we're talking about sustainability and green. 
uh, Wen Hong is uh, uh, in Beijing. He's uh, uh, representing climate bonds, and uh, climate bonds have been involved in various initiative region, initiatives regionally, uh, including with uh, uh, China, uh, helping uh, putting taxonomies, definitions, and of course, uh, the climate bond uh, um, climate bond standards that they have established many years ago has been instrumental for the development of this market. So over to you, Wang Hong. Thanks so much, Diana, for the uh, introduction and also for the invitation, um, giving me this opportunity to share uh, some of our observations about the development of um, the green finance and uh, the broader sustainability market in, in mainland China. Um, of course, there are many layers uh, to, to, to this topic and also to, to the answering of your question about uh, standard. Maybe for me to simplify and also to just to focus on the, the recent development of the Chinese mainland market, I think it is still useful that for us to use the, uh, the categorization uh, that is used by the Chinese regulators, especially the PBOC, uh, when it comes to uh, the kind of how do you structure uh, the green finance or climate finance market. Uh, so the PBOC has been using five pillars the definition, basically what is green and what is transition, uh, and of course what is brown, uh, the policy incentives, how can the government provide the policy support to incentivize and also to internalize the externalities of those activities, the disclosure, I think a lot of people have been talking about, uh, the specific financial instruments and tools, and the lastly, the international corporations. Uh, we're saying that um, this, the task is not just being undertaken uh, by the central bank, the financial regulator, but other ministries, especially the MEE and NDRC, uh, and are also in, in responsible for the development of this whole matrix. And we are saying in coordination has been improving, improving uh, across those um, those ministries, uh, especially when it comes to definition. So, um, so when it comes to definition uh, of what, what is green and the increasingly what is a, uh, a credible transition activities, as you mentioned, the, the Chinese uh, green catalog, uh, which will have one for uh, the fixed income for the debt capital market and one for lending, uh, has been there for quite a while. Uh, the green bond endorsed project catalog, which has been issued in 2015 and updated, had a major update in 2021, uh, is the kind of leading, one of the leading standard uh, that has been used, for example, for our, uh, as a basis for our work to compare Chinese definition uh, with international ones, especially that of the EU. And uh, as you may know, uh, that those definitions, there has been quite a bit of uh, discussion about how to align it further with um, those of the international capital market. And in 2021, uh, there has been some ex exclusion, uh, uh, some clarification of the fossil fuels and other, you know, uh, more high emitting activities has been excluded. And I understand that for the lending uh, standard, uh, it has also excluded the fossil fuels uh, in the most recent copy. Uh, and of course, there has been also more detailed standard um, for green banking, uh, including the improved governance requirements and also banking valuation systems uh, that has been recently added uh, to, the, to the banking, bank lending uh, requirements. Um, we are uh, also, uh, it's interesting that some of them may notice that there has been uh, a green industry guidance catalog that has been uh, issued by Driven and also been issued by the NDRC, the National Development and Reform Commission. There is currently a 2023 version that is up for uh, public consultation. And I was told, I think the people probably are not paying enough attention uh, to the recent, this recent update because I was told uh, the recent draft will serve as a basis. It has been serving as a basis and going forward, it will be serving as a basis for other, you know, uh, financial activities. So maybe it'll be good to, to see what's been changing in this industrial definition. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of work to do uh, to further coordinate a line uh, across different, um, especially across the industry and uh, the financial uh, regulator when it comes to definition. 
Um, there are also a couple of new development to watch. Uh, I'll be very quick. One is uh, some of uh, us has been really uh, working on and looking at the common ground taxonomy, uh, which is the first set of the definitions uh, developed jointly by the European Commission and also the Chinese PPOC. It provides an initial tool for the market to really rapidly screen what is taxonomy compatible activities. And it also is as the first and a common taxonomy between a developed economy and uh, one of the leading developing economy. It also serve. We, we are saying it being serving as a basis for other jurisdictions and other regulators to kind of think about and also uh, to structure uh, their own definitions. Um, most recently, example is probably Hong Kong. Uh, who is developing a regional uh, taxonomy, uh, which uh, with the support of the CBI, uh, which is roughly based on the common ground taxonomy. So um, we're seeing some enthusiasm, uh, both from the market and regulator, to this uh, to this effort of consolidation and harmonization. But there are also work to do. For example, how do you include additional sectors? Uh, in the in the kind of aligned taxonomy uh, that that they need to be interoperable uh, to different jurisdictions, what kind of guidance um, that you put out for implementation? Uh, how do you incorporate those taxonomies into further market products such as indexes, ETFs, and how do you include the transition you know um, activities in the uh, in the current standard? And I think those are all um, very worthy. Um, effort to do going forward and that we, we're actually starting the, the second phase uh, of the common ground taxonomy work and hopefully that work will tackle some of the uh, issues that I mentioned. And for the Hong Kong taxonomy, uh, I'll just give a little bit of plugging uh, to to uh, our colleagues at the Hong Kong Monetary Authority and CBI uh, that there's a prototype. Uh, it has been released. I think the uh, public consultation will end uh, at the end of the month. Uh, so very much looking forward to receive more comments uh, and feedbacks uh, to that draft and of course to discuss how do we make that in the balance between international compatibility with attention to the local specificities and the role of Hong Kong, of course, uh, as a channel and bridge uh, in, the, in the regional market. Uh, I, I'll end here for, for my sharing, but happy to talk about more uh, if there are any questions. Yeah, uh, thank you, Wen Hong, and thank you for bringing us home with the Hong Kong uh, taxonomy and the consultation. Um, many of you know that uh, the CIFMA will be responding to this one, and we've already uh, had conversations with the uh, CBI on it, and uh, it's super important for um, our members to to actually understand where uh, where the definitions will be and where the, where the, the, the overlaps and where the differences between different uh, jurisdictions will be, because as we mentioned, this this huge amount of investments that will need to happen, we need to have some common understanding as to uh, uh, what we what we call what in order to uh, satisfy our internal requirements. But before we return on this, and I have a question for you, which uh, I cannot kind of call not to asking you, but I will uh, I'll return to it. Uh, let me uh, let me get to Stanley because uh, Stanley uh, is actually based in uh, Shanghai and he is, uh, as I mentioned already, uh, head of uh, securities uh, uh, for China. So he is uh, uh, very close to actually observing what's happening at the market. So Stanley, what is you think the state of play at uh, in China when it comes to ESG? Uh, where is the market now, and what are the opportunities and, and challenges, perhaps? Yeah, thank you, thank you, Diana. And for me, um, China market remains the key yield driver in the investment universe. Um, so releasing the potential of uh, the responsible or sustainable investment in China poses great you know, opportunities to global investors. That's, uh, that's uh, the no doubt of it. Um, and as mentioned by then, by what I what I try to highlight today is um, you know as mentioned by Diana, so the China government has been set uh, the agenda for the carbon. Um, timeline. For example, the 3060, which means uh, uh, where China will target is to achieve the uh, carbon emission peak by 2030, and strive to achieve the carbon neutrality by 2060. Okay. So based on this uh, agenda, ESG and um, um, sustainable investment has been increasingly recognized by the Chinese financial institutions. Um, as of 2021, 83 Chinese financial institutions have joined the PRR, 
the principles for responsible investments. So the Chinese financial institutions has been playing a bigger role in the uh, process of this global responsible investments. And if you want to kind of look at the, the, the product level, um, so um, for the mutual funds, the ESG linked products has been growing rapidly. Uh, according to WIND, as of uh, 2021, there were around 160 ESG linked funds in the markets with a total market cap of around maybe 400 billion. So that's a lot. And in addition to this uh, um, ESG linked mutual funds, uh, the bank wealth management product also plays an important role in this ESG investing. So the bank, bank, wealth, managing, bank wealth management products have invested more than 220 billion into, into the green bonds. Okay. And uh, speaking of the, the green bonds at the instrument level, so since the issuance of the first green bonds in 2016, we have seen a total of 1.7 trillion of green bonds has been issued in China. So for, 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 the, for the past five years, the average growth of green bond issuance is around 25%. So that's, uh, that's amazing. And uh, even if you will look at the, um, the, what the government has to, and the, 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 the companies has been doing, they are trying to raise the public awareness of the ESG and the sustainable investments. Um, so early in this June, the very first international carbon neutrality exposition was held in Shanghai. So this is the first one. So lots of individuals and companies went to Shanghai to participate in this event. And the BNPB was also had the honor you know, to join this uh, event by sharing our commitments and the financial solutions. So um, from the government level to the institution level, to the product level, and to the instrument level, and even to the public awareness level, so ESG and the sustainable investment has been playing a bigger, bigger role in the, in China. So that's my observation. But having said that, um, uh, challenges are expected, as mentioned by Wen Hong. So there's no common ESG standard in China at the moment. So we have a little bit here and a little bit there, but um, we don't have a unified framework for the next step. And uh, whether the counter practice is compatible or <coughs> interoperable with the overseas standard, is, that's a question mark. And the second one is uh, information disclosure. Although the, there, was, there was improvement on the information disclosure, uh, including the, the data, the scope, but a lot more efforts are required to improve that as well. Thank you. Mm. Thank you very much, Stanley. <clears throat> Indeed, uh, China green bond market is one of the fast uh, developing one. <clears throat> and given the magnitude of the market in general, I think this is uh, clearly a huge potential. Sorry, I will cut on my, my, my voice. Um, meanwhile, um, I wanted to turn to C1 and talk about something uh, specific in the context of what instruments and uh, what opportunities exist. We often say that in order to tackle this and to actually properly channel investments, we need to put a price on carbon. And one of the ways to put a price on carbon is via carbon markets. So uh, China has been on a long journey uh, developing its uh, carbon markets. It's been years of uh, uh, testing and trying collaboration with uh, the European Union and uh, mm. other partners. And finally, uh, we got the, uh, the compliance market operational a couple of years ago. Mm. Several things have happened since. Uh, so uh, you are also uh, based in uh, Shanghai monitoring closely these things. We've had uh, several discussions within uh, Sigma members and mm -hmm. you on this. Uh, what is your perspective? Where are we now in this journey uh, in terms of uh, carbon market development? And what are the, the immediate and more long-term kind of development opportunities? Yeah, sure. Um, so um, ever since China started as a national mandatory market since 2021, um, the market has been developing very quickly and actually relevant rules and practices have been picking up very uh, rapidly. Um, so um, in terms of the developments, um, so in terms of the mandatory market, 
um, since it's based on its uh, almost two years of operations, the rules are being, uh, are being improved and uh, relevant data reporting uh, qualities have been improved. And now the, actually the, an actual expansion of the national mandatory market is being discussed. So just in, this, uh, in June, on June 16th and June 17th, uh, two meetings have been held. One is to discuss the inclusion of the steel, mark, steel industry into the national market. And the second is to include the industry of uh, petrol, petrochemical industries into the national market. So um, indeed, the uh, mandatory uh, national market is um, going to be expanded. Um, and that would uh, probably happen in the next uh, in next year or so. And um, in terms of the voluntary market, actually this year uh, would be a very exciting year because everyone is looking at and expecting the relaunching of the CCER. Uh, it has been discussed for years, but this year uh, there are signals of uh, some real development, uh, including the uh, establishment of the Beijing Green Exchange, uh, which was uh, established to facilitate the uh, trading of the CCERs and also the uh, MEE um, in, the, uh, in, in, in March, they uh, published a, a solicitation paper for the methodologies for evaluating and determining CCERs. And we actually assisted as IFMA and worked with as IFMA members to provide responses for, to this uh, consultation paper. And so, um, the relaunching of CC uh, and also the relevant regulators have uh, stated in different uh, occasions that CCER is going to launch soon. So um, because CCER is a product that um, it, uh, the trading is not limited only to industry participants, but could be traded by other industries. And it could also be used to offset the participants uh, obligation to redeem in the carbon market. So uh, the CCER uh, tradings could be quite active and it could be quite an uh, uh, attractive market. And that's why um, uh, this, this would be some uh, significant change in the uh, voluntary market this year. And also uh, we have, of course, during the past year we have seen uh, in terms of voluntary market, we have seen the Hong Kong core climate, which actually connects Hong Kong and China and the whole world. And uh, also in Hainan, there has been establishment of uh, International Carbon Trading Center, which is uh, for the purpose of serving uh, trading of uh, international voluntary markets. And also with this green uh, exchange, uh, being launched, uh, we do see uh, that the in the terms of voluntary markets, there is a great potential to expand. Um, and also, uh, in terms of market participants, we can see that earlier this year, CSRC actually issued uh, no objection letters to six securities companies for them to engage in carbon trading. So um, although financial institutions are still uh, not participating largely in the carbon trading directly, but this is a signal that um, the financial institution's participation is being considered and might be further progressed. Mm. Yeah, and this is fantastic news, mm. uh, uh, which we've been kind of uh, uh, very uh, encouraged to hear because uh, the China carbon market, both the uh, compliance and the voluntary, are huge. Mm -hmm. uh, only the first stage, which is including only the electricity uh, market, which yeah. is now included in compliance, it's yeah. already the biggest uh, carbon market in the world. Mm -hmm. If you add steel, uh, petrochemicals, and any of the other uh, industry sectors that will need to be included, you, you, you see what you're talking about. Yeah. Uh, similar story with the voluntary carbon market. And uh, it's interesting, and perhaps if you do have any kind of expectations, please, please share them with us. Would China approach the voluntary uh, carbon market as an opportunity to finance their transition uh, by uh, using uh, kind of uh, outside finance? or? would China uh, open the huge opportunity for abatement projects to the world so that uh, other jurisdictions and, and pretty much can export carbon uh, offsets? 
I don't know whether you have a, a view or a sense of what direction this might take, but uh, yeah. if you do. Yeah, um, I, I think there have been a lot of discussions and also I think the uh, regulators have also expressed their view that uh, the primary goal for the carbon market is to actually facilitate the uh, com the, the goal of the carbon neutrality and carbon picking. Um, I, I, I think for now uh, it's not intended to um, largely uh, encourage the uh, uh, like the carbon trading as a financial investments, but we I think um, foreign investment in terms of the green projects and the green uh, sustainable finance economy and the investment in the relevant projects are, are, are welcomed. Um, I, I think for now, in terms of carbon trading, um, the financial institutions and uh, foreign entities are allowed to participate to a certain extent, but there are certain limitations. For example, um, as we know that uh, for the national market, only well, foreign uh, only the industry participants are allowed to participate. Uh, for local in the local markets uh, like the uh, local CEAs, local CERs, and CCERs, uh, well, there are no restrictions for foreign entities to participate. That, but um, only a few local exchanges actually accept uh, an offshore entity to open accounts. Um, it is said that uh, the CCER when it's opened, the Beijing exchange uh, is saying that it's positioned as an exchange facing globally, but uh, the detailed rules uh, still need to be watched to see uh, what the qualification requirements for the, for the members. And um, for, um, for participation by the onshore entities of financial institutions, um, well, in terms of direct participation in carbon trading, there are still certain exchanges because um, the financial institutions are generally regulated and in terms of their business scope and what they can trade. Um, so uh, basically, they will, there will be restrictions or uncertainties as to uh, their trading in the carbon market, if, if, except uh, they have approvals from regulators such as the uh, securities companies. And in terms of uh, asset management uh, business or asset management products that's run by the financial institutions, uh, because that currently carbon markets are not classified as securities or as derivatives, so there are still um, for for the financial institutions to invest through their uh, financial uh, asset management products. There are certain restrictions. Of course, there are um, there might be. Possibilities, for example, to approach to explore, such as investments through a subsidiary or uh, privately released funds or uh, through trust or other structures, but that would also depend on the nature of the specific uh, financial institution and also uh, based on, also uh, subject to communication with the regulators as to um, the permissibility of this uh, such investment. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, I see a, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, uh, opportunities for development yeah. and actually um, uh, picking on this I would like to ask Stanley uh, you've been involved in all sorts of uh, kind of trading all sorts of uh, uh, different uh, uh, instruments and uh, based on the existing connect schemes uh, for example uh, what could be the lessons that we can learn and kind of apply these lessons to the new sustainability linked instruments that will emerge and how can we actually make this bridge work for this new flow of investments and opportunities that will emerge? Yeah, thank you. Um, so for me, um, Carbon Connect is definitely a very interesting idea. And uh, more and more people start to think, um, you know, um, the carbon as uh, tradable assets or financial institutions. Even at uh, the um, International Carbon Neutrality Exposition in Shanghai I mentioned earlier, so um, a few companies approached our booth of BMP Paribas to ask, hey, I got some you know, carbon credit. Can I sell it for money? Or I can use it as a collateral for, for financing? So you can see the perception of the carbon is, um, is evolving. Okay. And uh, so for me, um, if we imagine this is the case, 
So I would say a few things that we need to um, be noticed. Um, for one, we need to have a clear understanding of what is to be traded and how it's going to work. Um, because for bond connect or stock connect, you have um, you are very familiar with the bond or equities. So what is to be traded, how to price it, how it's going to work. But for, for, but for carbon markets, it's uh, not that familiar. And uh, you know, since you mentioned the CCR, maybe I can elaborate a little bit on how it works. Because in China, there are basically two types of um, um, instruments. One is the um, carbon credit or carbon quota. Because according to the, the 3060 agenda, so China has the plan you know, to reduce the carbon emission step by step. So in this case, many manufacturers, especially the industry ones, will get the uh, carbon quota, carbon credit. So within these limits, you can produce the uh, carbon emission amounts equivalent to this quota. Okay, so this is mandatory. And uh, on the other hand, there's another program called the CCER, China Certified Emission Reduction. So it basically refers to um, um, the carbon emission reduction activities conducted by the companies on a voluntary basis and certified by the Chinese government. So it's more like an incentive system. So it, as long as um, you have internal uh, projects like um, uh, renewable uh, power generation or waste to energy projects, whatever, as long as it can reduce the carbon emission and the certified by the Chinese government, it can offset the carbon emission. So then how it work? Um, let's put it a simple way. For example, a company got a quota of 100 ton uh, at the beginning of the year. Um, so which means in, as long as uh, the production of this company you know, falls into this um, quota, you know, he's OK. And uh, then the company get a very positive view on the markets and they decide to increase the production and hence will result in more carbon emission. So for example, 120. And in this case, this new additional quota will not be supported by the quota they have. So they have a few options. One, they can go to the, um, the market mentioned by Suyuan, National Carbon Trading Market, to, to purchase additional one, for example, 20 ton. Or if they have an internal project that can be certified as CCER, they can use this certified um, uh, the quota to offset the additional consumption they, they need. Or they can use both. Okay, so this is how the carbon you know, market works in China. So you can see a clear difference between the equity and the bond markets. So when we say the bond connect um, or, or carbon connect, potential carbon connect, we need to have a clear understanding of what is to be traded and the, how it's going to work. Okay. And the, the second one is the infrastructure. Because you know for stock connect or bond connect, the stock exchange or bond, uh, the stock exchanges need to be connected with each other to facilitate the trading. And the, the, the depositories or the clearing house need to be connected to facilitate the post-trading activities, like the clearing or settlements. But under the carbon, the carbon markets, especially uh, even for the, 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 the national trading, uh, carbon trading markets, so there is no unified infrastructure. So the current setup is uh, you have the uh, documentation and registration in Hubei province, an uh, inner city. And uh, you have the trading activities maintained in Shanghai. Okay. So in order to facilitate this connect program, you will have a, a unified uh, uh, um, um, infrastructure set up. And uh, even for CCR, it's not, it's not a national one at the moment. It's more like a regional one. So which means the registration of CCR, for example, in Shanghai city, cannot, can only be transferred or um, registered or deregistered in within the city. So there are limitations you know, at the moment. And the, the third one is definitely a rules of regulation to make sure the whole connected programs can work. Okay, so basically that's my, 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 my views. Thank you, Stanley. Uh, indeed, the, the role of definitions, that's why we started with definitions and uh, uh, me being a lawyer have uh, a huge respect to, to definitions and how, uh, how you actually define things because at the end, you see, unless you understand what exactly you're trading, 
and you can put this into the, the existing frameworks or, or the existing mechanisms, then it's very difficult. And the, in the case of carbon markets, actually, and uh, carbon credits and carbon offsets, this has been a huge issue. And uh, we've been deliberating at the SIFMA of whether we shall advocate more towards this being treated as an asset, as a financial instrument, as to uh, as to liability, as to property, what would a carbon uh, offset uh, and uh, and uh, would be? And uh, um, I just have to share with uh, everyone that we've been working on a white paper uh, on uh, actually uh, developing carbon markets in Asia for uh, quite a few months now. And uh, uh, watch the space. We are going to announce uh, the launch in a couple of months or so. But that's one of the key issues that we've been actually trying to uh, to unpick and understand because this is not a classic uh, asset, it's not a classic equity, it's not a classic financial instrument. Mm -hmm. So really, we have to be inventive and see what, what is going to work in the best interest of uh, everyone. Uh, so thank you for, for sharing this. And um, perhaps we have a, a few minutes left, uh, and um, I had in my list of things that I would like to touch upon uh, a couple more questions, and one of them is on transition. And I would like to uh, uh, go back to uh, Wen Hong on this question. Uh, this is going to be a long journey. We're talking about decades of actually uh, following, developing, trying. Uh, perhaps some of the trials will, be, uh, will end up with error, but uh, it, it's nevertheless a, a journey. So transitioning to this final point is very important. And Having clear understanding up front at uh, where's, where's your road, where, where exactly, you know the direction, but which road you're going to take uh, to this direction is super important because a lot of the investments that uh, we'll be doing will be uh, very long-term investments. And uh, unless we, we have the reassurance that we're doing the right decision, that we're measuring the right risks now, uh, this is going to put us in a difficult position. So. Um, Wen Hong, if I may ask you, uh, uh, you work on transition, you've worked across the region and uh, uh, across the globe, frankly, and helping governments and institutions and private uh, 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 bodies actually understand transition and try to, to conceptualize it in a, in a better way. Uh, how do you think the transition should look uh, in the China case and where do you think we do know, uh, we hear rumors and anecdotal kind of uh, suggestions that there is some talk about transition pathways in China. Where do things, uh, do you think things stand in uh, China right now? Sure, Thank, thanks Diana for the question. So maybe, maybe let me start uh, by saying that the very idea uh, of transition or transition finance, at least the way that at CBI we are approaching this piece uh, is built on the premise that this hugely successful sustainable finance market of the past decade, right, shouldn't be just limited to the green or the, the very dark green part of the economy, which is, of course, only accounting for no more than 10% of the whole GDP, but you should really looking at the, the the others, right, the, the hard to base sectors like steel and petrochemicals and power and finding a way uh, to support uh, their orderly and uh, clear transition to net zero. Um, I think that this is uh, the premise that has been now been uh, embraced by the global capital market, but it is also astonishing how fast uh, this concept has gone from a, by the French topic to something that everybody's talking about here in China uh, over a year. Um, uh, now you're saying that the deputy governor and the governor of PBOC giving a very clear signal that uh, China is going to um, will develop mechanisms, standard, you know, the whole system around the transition and financing uh, credible transition. Uh, and this is a sign uh, that really China has been keeping up uh, closely with international development, but also constantly search for the new, you know, directions and innovations for its own, you know, um, um, climate goals or financing uh, its, its economic transition to net zero. Uh, I'm still saying that uh, the government has been a driving force uh, in, in this, like you said, a very complicated piece. Uh, and at the top level, we have the 3060 target that everybody knows. And of course, there's a one plus one policy, which is a one 
overall framework about net zero, but then you have specific roadmaps and pathways uh, that as that's being constantly rolled out and also updated for each sectors. Uh, the People's Bank of China, uh, together also with the Green Finance Committee, has been you know developing and studying uh, the kind of standard and taxonomy and the sectorial criteria uh, for the for the transition finance. I think that this this will be the one piece to watch for uh, because this is official and. The, uh, and as you know, the market has been quite policy driven. Uh, so the market is really keen and really looking for a an official standard, um, although probably going to be a prototype uh, with limited criteria uh, in different uh, limited sectors. Uh, but it will be coming out quite soon, I think later this year, uh, to give an initial signal and ideas of what China uh, things about the transition. Um, and of course, you, at the kind of product level, uh, you also see already the sustainable link product like transition bond uh, and SOBs that has been kind of introduced by LAFME, uh, early, I think earlier last year, and there has been quite a bit of issuances um, uh, that has been uh, being on in the market. So um, there's no question that transition is one biggest thing uh, that we're seeing this year, uh, but we also see the standard uh, has been varying at different scales uh, with different kind of approaches, indicators, benchmarks, or lack thereof. Uh, but yeah, but the, the, the PBOC standard, which is forthcoming, uh, will be based on the G20 transition, um, transition finance um, principles. And I think that it will be one place to watch uh, very, very uh, for us to watch very clearly and closely. Uh, but we're also saying um, in the industrial sector, so many, many different kind of targets uh, and the commitment and actions uh, coming from the industries, uh, from steel, from cement, from power sector, from petrochemicals. It's very interesting to see how how those um, you know targets and standard has get consolidated and translate into something operable by the financial sector. Of course, you need a great deal of the inter kind of coordination across the ministries and also the kind of dialogue uh, between the financial sectors and, uh, and the industry sectors uh, when it comes to what is credible transition and what is, what is something that they can do in a, a kind of realistic an orderly time frame. Uh, we're also seeing some mismatches in terms of the stated ambitions and also the, the actions that, that is needed. Uh, for example, uh, because China set the goal of 2060 to carbon uh, to net zero carbon, uh, and there's also a gap between the 2060 and 2050 in terms of how soon uh, the economy uh, need to reach net zero. So there are still some questions about uh, what's the immediate action or the action for the for the next three to five years, um, while everybody kind of keep their eye on the 2060 goal, uh, there seems to be some thought about waiting for the price, to, the cost and price to come down, uh, or there's some kind of technology breakthrough, whereas the kind of the, the real decision, uh, especially in terms of capex decisions in the sectors, need to be made over the next three to five years. Otherwise, for those assets who has a short life, usually up to 30 to 40 years, you're locked in your economy into something uh, that is high emitting uh, pathway. So this is a huge uh, issue. I think the, uh, the regulators and market and the industry regulators are, are tackled together. How do you push for the international alignment? How do you attend to local practices? But also how do you avoid lock-ins uh, for the, for the uh, for the in industry and for the technologies on the high carbon pathways, how do you think about the piece of the just transition? And also, how do you, uh, while you maintain the kind of international operative interoperability, how do you incorporate the specific approaches and regulations and data availability from the Chinese market? I think it's a very very big topic uh, to discuss, uh, as there are many different aspects to, yes, to yeah. think about it. Uh, but I, I just want to end up by saying that uh, it is also a great opportunity uh, for the international investor to think about 
uh, to pay more uh, close attention to the to this market because it's going to be materialized quite soon. It's already there's a lot of uh, movements and also the CBI certification will have uh, specific uh, criteria for transitional activities along with other standards such as SPTI uh, can also form the basis for international investors tapping to uh, this market, especially in hard to base sectors. Uh, as um, constantly there will be a need for credible standard and guidelines, and we are also supporting the Chinese uh, regulators in uh, you know, aligning the, Ch the Chinese approach to international ones. Uh, and, uh, Thank and here. you. Thanks. Thank you, Wen Hong. We are uh, seriously out of time. We can continue this conversation forever, I'm sure, because this is interesting. And for us in financial sector, actually understanding something which is not finance is super difficult. But let's stop here and we'll continue over coffee. Thank you so much, Wen Hong. Thank you, Sri Thank you, Stanley. Thank you. Thank you.